Welcome back. The Black Lives Matter movement has brought to light injustices we as a community have failed to address for many years. What are the systemic barriers black Muslim women face in the mosques and in their daily lives? To help us tackle these issues, we have with us our returning guest, Tamaj Garad, a multidisciplinary storyteller who uses poetry, theater, and music to bring her stories to life. Here is Tamaj performing Black Gold. Black Muslim girls, black Muslim girls, black Muslim girls, you are more than magic. You are a multitude of dope fly out of this world, love making love to love, melanated masterpiece. There is nothing tragic about you. The tragedy is living in the kind of world that brings you the kind of grief that has you digging the earth with your teeth, duality wrapped at your tongue as you code switch deep enough to be black and Muslim, but rarely at the same time. Your spine is the site of intergenerational trauma, and they mine your back until it cracks and exposes the black gold from your backbone that was sought. But this is not a minery. This is not a minery. We are the kind of tired you become when you're both the product and the labor. Because apparently there is a bed here on our backs that some will sleep on yet call themselves woke. But this is not a dreamland. This is quicksand. We are women with a softness that will sink you and lift you at the same time. Prayer bead woven fingers when we are triggered then proceed to whisper scripture and strive higher than the brand of justice we were promised here. Here, in the dance between the ephemeral and eternal. Here, in the in-between. Here, in the you can't hear yourself loud enough to hear your dreams sometimes. Here. Here, here in a place where a Pakistani woman at the masjid once asked me where I'm from. So I told her I'm Ethiopian. And she says, wow, just like Bilal, but then mixes it with dirty looks, mixed with, that must be why you're doing it wrong, do it like this, mixed with, so what are you mixed with? Like it's a compliment, and I want to tell her I'm mixed with black and even blacker than that, unapologetically blacker than black, black Muslim girls, black Muslim girls. Black Muslim girls, though the world is burning with your names right now, you are not a forest fire. You are a skyline at sunrise in a city of broken hearts. You are the enigma of love coagulating within you to run through you. You are the brilliance of many suns and the wisdom of many moons. I know the system makes you nervous sometimes. But your nervous system was designed to feed you feeling, impulses through your pulse for healing, your winters withering in their bloom while holding on to their truths. Your blackness has always been in season. Your blackness has always been in season. Your blackness has always been in season. So Tamaj, that, uh, the black gold poem that you just performed, I think it spoke to me a lot about or what really stood out to me was the experience that you uh, faced in the, in the mosque. So tell me a little bit about that uh, and how that's reinforced in, in the mosque environment as a black Muslim woman. Yeah, so in the, the poem, it's taken from a true story. I was at a- That's very unfortunate. Yeah, it's, it, it happens a lot more often than we talk about in our community, unfortunately, but I was at a masjid. Um, in Toronto, it's, it's strange because like a lot of the masjids are like, you know, Pakistani dominated culture and specific? cultural specific yeah. it's very so I find that a lot of the times those are um, the spaces where I'm at for Jummah prayer and that sort of thing um, so this particular mosque was um, mostly Pakistani um, people attending and so during the khutbah actually you're not even supposed to talk during khutbah <laughs> but during the khutbah okay, it happened th okay yeah a woman was like you know you're like sitting in a really disrespectful way and she actually started by asking me where I'm from and like kind of started this conversation and I was so just during the like, khutbah this whole conversation is going on before the khutbah she okay. asked me where I'm from so I told her and then the khutbah started and then she was like sis you're not supposed to sit like that and I was ignoring her because I'm just like I'm trying to listen right so um and she was just like you know is that how you do that in Ethiopia or some some sort of like comment like that oh, and okay. and a lot of the times there's this kind of, um, you know, religious superiority um, that is felt um, by non-black Muslims. And uh, the assumption is that black Muslims are not uh, Muslim enough or authentically Muslim enough. And obviously, we know that that's not true. But 
Um, that's something that I think that is reinforced in the ways in which we are treated in masjid spaces, even like when you go to a conference, there is a lot of tokenizing that happens um, with uh, black scholars and that sort of thing. And although the things are shifting, but definitely not um, mm -hmm. enough and not quickly enough, and um, there is not enough intentional movement happening um, with within the community by non-black Muslim allies. Mm -hmm. And so that sense of kind of allyship just doesn't exist. And so it does make frequenting Muslim spaces difficult as somebody who is black. And uh, a lot of the times, you know, there, I experience my Muslimness differently as a, as a black Muslim. What about, you know, you wear a hijab and a headscarf. How is that? Is that further perpetuated in the mosque in terms of your sense of alienation uh, from the from the mosque, or is that kind of like okay, she's wearing a hijab, a black Muslim woman is wearing a hijab, therefore she's going to I'm going to accept her in some way. Well, I think that a lot of the times there's this like because you know I'm I, I have li a lighter skin tone, and um, I think a lot of people try to unread my blackness. What, so do you mean, what do you mean by that? So I mean that um, I've been in situations where people are like, well, you know, you're kind of still brown, right? Or they'll try to kind of put me into a category that they feel is comfortable for them and acceptable and digestible for them. So, and minimize your identity. Exactly. So that that's like the erasure of, of blackness in those spaces is also very common and, mm -hmm. and is, is anti-black, right? So it's like their hunch is that, oh, she's East African, she's black, but let me put her into this either this other category where you're not black or brown or this like category that that's closer to um, something that they feel is acceptable or something that they can understand mm -hmm. instead of actually getting to know black Muslims um, there is the sense of kind of like let, let me put you in a category I feel comfortable with what about um, I know we're talking a lot about your black Muslim experience within the Muslim community what about outside of the Muslim community do you find that you're um, I guess I'm just trying to create sort of, okay, in the Muslim community, it's clear, and let's call it what it is, you're not, it's not a very inclusive community, while I think, you know, the issue is being talked about. What about outside the Muslim community? So outside the Muslim community, you know, we deal with the, the same things that other Muslims deal with in certain ways, so the Islamophobia, but then it's a, a nuanced Islamophobia because there is the, the intersection of the anti-blackness and anti-Muslim, mm -hmm. right? So I think that people have a hard time understanding that, you know, it's the Islamophobia I experience as a black Muslim is different, you know? So, uh, um, and that the... Can I, can I stop you there? Can you yeah. break it down for our viewers? Because some people might not understand, and I just want to help, um, I guess, I guess yeah, help them understand a bit more. So when you say you experience Islamophobia differently, um, what do you mean by that? How is it different for you? Well, anti-black racism um, and Islamophobia, I think that um, oftentimes the Islamophobia can be more severe. Like even when you think about um, in our city, the, the people that are experiencing a lot of uh, racial profiling and police brutality are black Muslims mm -hmm. in Toronto, yeah. right? And so um, there is that kind of like um, that intersection of blackness and Muslimness that um, perpetuates and, and also amplifies the violence and the discrimination that we feel on a systemic level, um, in, whether it's in our institutions or um, in you know, places of, that we seek service in. Um, there's always that kind of um, experience of having to kind of um, navigate as a black person and as a Muslim, especially when you're a visible Muslim. Yeah. Um, and even if you pr are you know, from a Muslim majority country, like um, us, our Somali brothers and sisters, um, even though uh, like a young Somali man, for example, may not be wearing a kufi or a thobe, they, he's still read as a Muslim because people think Somalia, Muslims, and the associations that they make there, right? So um, I think that people are starting to kind of to, to understand this, but it's still that we still have a lot of work to do mm -hmm. in terms of um, awareness, in terms of uh, building our communities in a way that is more inclusive and equitable, and actually starting to have these conversations, at, not just on public forums, but at our dinner tab tables. It's people um, checking their racist uncle or auntie or whoever at the dinner table yeah. that is actually <laughs> so going true. to make a, a bigger difference, right? Because who is at these conferences and spaces where anti-black racism is being discussed. They're not even happening that often, but when they are happening, it's 
obviously the people who are willing to be in those spaces in the first place. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, it is a bit of an echo chamber. Not that the, there's no value in that, there definitely is to build community, but we also need to be reaching out. Um, allies need to be having those conversations. So non-black Muslims need to be having those conversations with their family members and their friends in any instance of anti-blackness or you know at, when it happens in their interpersonal interactions. Now, I'm sure you've been in spaces where you've talked about this issue and received some resistance. Um, so what advice do you have for, for example, uh, I, was, I was laughing when you talked about uncles and aunties who don't really understand this issue because yeah. I can just picture how the conversation would go. <laughs> yeah. That's why I was laughing. Younger people but, too, not to... <laughs> yeah, no, of course, you're right. Younger people too, but yeah. I just had an image in my head, which is probably not a good thing. But what advice do you have if, you, you know, we know going into this, these are difficult conversations to have, and maybe there are people who genuinely want to have these conversations, but just don't know how to get over that um, that first struggle or that first hunch? What advice do you have given your own experiences? Um, I would say start having conversations. I think that's why storytelling is important. That's why it's important to um, share our stories. And to, so but just to get over that fear and just put it out there. Um, well, for I think that people need to listen. People need to listen to the stories of black Muslims. And, mm -hmm. that, and that's part of the reason why the series was so important for me to do is because there is a gap in understanding and there is kind of a gap in our communities where, you know, we almost want to kind of sugarcoat everything, this, this kind of under this umbrella of unity. But for unity, you have to know who you're uniting with. Yeah. And if you don't know people, then you don't know, you know, how to, to engage with them or you don't, you, if you're not really honoring people's um, story, their history, their, who they are authentically on a very real level, then there is no community, right? So I think that ex instead of like building these shallow communities where people aren't really knowing each other or people are only uh, wanting to seek out inf information about somebody that that they can easily process and digest and feel okay about, I think we need to and start also having... just further perpetuate the stereotypes, right? Exactly, and further, further perpetuating stereotypes, I think we need to actually start um, having conversations and, and hearing people's stories and listening to, to I think non-black Muslims need to start listening to Muslim, uh, uh, black Muslims and to, to have those um, difficult conversations and those difficult moments of reflections. And when I, when I say difficult, I really mean it because it's not, it's not easy to hold yourself accountable all the yeah. time, right? It's a lot of like silencing your ego. It's a lot of reflection. It's a lot of, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of learning and unlearning. So I think that that needs to start happening to build the confidence to be able to even, or to even know how to call someone in and have those conversations with your loved ones. I'm sure it's exhausting to have to share the same message, but I genuinely appreciate you coming on the show and taking the time to share this with our viewers. So thank you so much, Tamaj. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Hey YouTube, we hope you benefited from this video. If you liked it, or if you didn't, let us know in the comments below. And if you're interested in learning more, check out some of our other videos. And don't forget to subscribe so you can get new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday.